Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. We are going to be talking a little bit about hemochromatosis. Paul, this this condition scares me because I, I didn't understand it that well before this talk with Dr. Tapper. How about you? So, well, it still scares me, but now in a different way. But yeah, the, the same type of thing. Have I been not looking for this as aggressively as I should have? Um, but I, I feel like I have a better handle on it now, now that I've listened to the episode and even took part in the episode, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and and this is a common. So, one of the big take home points from this episode is that the actual mutations that can cause hereditary hemochromatosis, they're pre, it's pretty common. Uh, like heterozygous, pretty common. Even homozygous is relatively common, but the penetrance of it is very is very low. So and variable. So not everybody, even if they're homozygous for the mutation, which is like the C. 282Y is the one that most common. Even if they have two copies of that, they might not have hereditary hemochromatosis. So what's what's probably more common is the patient with this dismetabolic iron overload, Paul. Ever I had you ever heard of that before? I, I hadn't. I had not heard it referred to in that way, but it makes a lot of sense like everything Dr. Tapper says. Yeah. So this is where the patient with metabolic syndrome, uh, also they have some inflammation of the liver. Their serum ferritin can be elevated in the same way that you might get with hereditary hemochromatosis. And he he said that he actually tries to, before he goes and sends the genetic testing, when he sees somebody with a high ferritin, if they have metabolic syndrome, he'll actually try to work on weight loss, improving their lifestyle. If they're drinking alcohol, that's another one that really can drive the, the ferritin levels through the roof. He'll try to get them off alcohol, improve their metabolic health, and then repeat the levels and defer that testing. And this, again, is his expert opinion. The guidelines will usually tell you to just do the hereditary testing right away. Right. But because of that low penetrance, uh, he he doesn't like to, you know, the, the, the you can get, you can get, go down a bad path if you do the genetic testing and then the, you have a patient convinced they have hemochromatosis, even if they don't. Right. Yeah. Right. Like along those lines, um, on the inpatient side of things where we ferritin is checked for God knows what reason half the time, maybe the hemoglobin slightly lower, whatever reason it was actually, we were talking before we started recording, I think as part of the COVID-19 sort of order set, it was not unusual to check ferritin, um, and some institutions. So it just don't forget it's, that's an acute phase reactant. So if someone has a lot of inflammation, the ferritin is going to be high. So in the same way that that sort of chronic low grade inflammation in the outpatient setting, will push the ferritin up a little bit. Um, if someone has a really acute process going on, like infection, like malignancy, um, like God forbid, human phagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, like that's 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 not hemochromatosis. You know, you should probably let them cool off. You should not rely on inpatient labs um, to start your your diagnostic considerations for hemochromatosis unless there's some other compelling reason to do so. Um, so just just you know, I think the, the the right practice is probably to get them over whatever acute things happening. Um, do your follow up labs in the office, and then if still elevated, then start thinking about what could be causing this, and, and then going down that particular rabbit hole. I wasn't sure if the if I should call you a show off or give a standing ovation for uh, pronouncing H L H correctly. That was uh, oh, that you. was fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> I was practicing in my head a lot of, before we started recording, so I'm glad it paid off. All right. So, what numbers should people look for in women and men? They're slightly different, but basically, if the ferritin is greater than two hundred uh, to three hundred, depending on if it's a woman or a man, or if the iron saturation is greater than forty five to fifty percent again, depending on if it's a, a woman or a man, then then you would consider this this person could have hereditary hemochromatosis. In Dr. Tapper's practice, as I said, he would try to get them off alcohol, improve their metabolic health before he's, you know, getting too too worked up about those numbers. But those those would be numbers you'd find over time. And if despite if despite doing those things, those levels remain above 200, uh, ferritin above 200, TSAT above 45%. You know, you can consider sending that genetic testing uh, for that with the appropriate counseling. And then if you find hereditary hemochromatosis, you should really stage the liver, which, Paul, liver biopsies for everybody? Is that I, happily, it, it sounds like now that we have good serologic measures, we don't have to be um, setting small pieces of liver on fire to look at the iron content. Now yeah. we have other ways of looking at inflammation, it sounds like. Right. So he threw out there Fib4. You could do calculate a Fib4 score. Um, of course, just looking at 
their bilirubin, their albumin, their platelets, you know, their coags, that sort of stuff, just the normal kind of things we would look at to, to determine if someone has concern for cirrhosis. And then there's this elastography, uh, which can be done with like an ultrasound type machine, the thumper type machine, as uh, as our liver prof would have would have told us, or uh, there's an MRI version of it, and that can that has largely replaced uh, replaced the liver biopsy for determining somebody with advanced fibrosis. I was going to say, I think a very reasonable question would be, why did you have a liver expert talk about this hereditary iron overload state? And I, it, it's we discussed that. The classic things that we learned in medical school in terms of like the bronze diabetes presentation of hemochromatosis is just not the way that we're seeing it. The liver is, is most commonly the, the way that you're actually going to find this thing. So unfortunately, one more medical school teaching, while not untrue, um, is not as nearly as useful as we are led to believe. So it's going to be the liver first, probably, so, which is why it's so important to make sure that you're doing that staging that you're talking about. And if you haven't heard one of our episodes with Dr. Elliot Tapper, he is just a an, an amazing guest and definitely... You should listen to anything that we do with him and follow him on Twitter because he is fantastic. But, Paul, it's time to go. So uh, I should say that this has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. We Paul? love our knowledge food, folks. <laughs> Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>